Well, folks, how are you doing? Lockdown's easing a bit, and I bet we're glad about that. Um, government's given us some road map back to normal life, some, some route map, and uh, with its different, different phases, and we've, we've started on, on phase one. And as it's, things have been eased and people have been moving about a bit more, so I, I've heard one or three or four folks saying, well, when are we getting back to church then? Well, not for a while. The earliest that the, any kind of gatherings are, are imagined is uh, phase three, which, uh, I don't know, probably maybe August or even September before, before we're at that stage. But we've not been closed. We've just been looking at different ways of being church, different ways of trying to minister, and in many respects, we've still been active. And the church has often managed without buildings. Look at the New Testament church and how fast it was growing in different places across um, the Roman Empire, all without buildings. Or the Chinese church and the second half of the 20th century, and indeed into the 21st century. It's been growing phenomenally. So too these days is the church in Iran. And for different reasons, both of, in both of these countries, buildings were not, not allowed or not wise things to have. And yet, it didn't stop the church growing. It didn't stop the church being the church. So in this time of doing without and having to do and think about church a bit differently, one opportunity is for us to stop and consider what is essential and why. What is it, the essence of being church? We've grown into our pattern, a tradition, where for many people the organizations or particular meetings have become more important than Jesus, more important than church itself. Grown into a pattern, a tradition where for some people the different social events and gatherings that we could do were more important than Jesus himself. Maybe it's time for us to stop and think about that and indeed to repent of that. Because the church is the church of Jesus Christ. It's not a religious club to please and satisfy us. We have, as I say, been trying to be as active as possible in these circumstances, and we've still provided a Sunday service. There's some folks doing the prayer course that we had advertised. There's the songs and chatter coming up from time to time, the Claremont calling and taking it further discussions with the services in Holy Week, and we'll still be looking at different ways that we can provide ministry and, and service. And these work well for the, those the already churched, for those that are, who are not yet churched, they're de-churched well. There was, we did a reading of John T. Alcock's book about eternal life and the, the lead up to Easter, and we've found that in other ways people have found us or found their way back to us. And I know that some of you have been sharing what's available online with others. And today um, we'll be thinking in, in Claremont Calling about a couple of other instances for, for taking that message further afield. We're going to hear from an organization called Solas, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes, but also from, we're going to hear from Heather Sturgeon, who's uh, got an idea for something that we can put outside in a display, and we'll be saying more about that too. And so the issue is not really for us when can we get back, but how can we continue to do church? The issue is not will we be able to meet this Sunday or that Sunday or the next Sunday, but how do we go on living the Lord's way, loving the Lord's people, and sharing the Lord's message in these different times? In terms of that hard question about being back here, it's, it's not going to be entirely up to us. It's not simply something that the Kurt Session can decide to do. There will be guidance from the government about what is and what isn't allowed. But also, it seems likely that we're going to have to get permission from, say, presbytery or so on to, to have uh, things cleared. We want to make sure when we come back that it's safe to do so. Were we to be back and then find that someone had been here who was um, infected with the COVID-19 and, and that deep clean was needed, I'm told that the deep clean might cost as much as £20,000. We don't want to be paying that, but more importantly, we don't want to be putting people at risk. And so we wait not a waiting that's doing nothing, 
but a waiting that's giving us that time to stop and think and, and seek God. What is first? What comes matters most? And also a time in which we look at different opportunities in different ways to live the Lord's way, to love the Lord's people, and to share the Lord's message. Thanks. Good morning, Claremont family. It's Heather Sturgeon here. Missing everyone, missing the company of being in the church all together. Hope you're all taking care and keeping well in these difficult times. I would like to ask you all to help me out in a wee community challenge that we're going to do in and around the church. I'm afraid I don't have any wool, so I can't do a blue, blue peter and show you here's one I made earlier. But what I'm going to ask you to do is make some pom-poms for us. If you have any wool, spare wool, make some pom-poms. And if you could hang them round the railings in front of the church or round about the sign. We're going to put up some information as people walk past they can see. If you want to write a wee prayer and post it in a box that's going to be there, that'd be absolutely brilliant too. If you don't, please feel free to hang your pom-poms anywhere along the church in the front of the railings. We're also going to hopefully get everyone involved in this because pom-poms are something that probably everybody can do. Young people and more mature people too. Even I can do it, so it's not that hard. I'd also like to have another wee project we're going to do if you can find some pebbles or stones and if you can get the children or yourself if you like to do crafty things if you want to paint your stone anything you like and um, we had a lovely one that someone's given me and it's just different colors of the rainbow in the middle of it it says the word hope and if you want to write a bible verse or a prayer on the bottom of the the um, pebble that would be absolutely brilliant too again when you pass the church you'll see we're going to leave a wee trail of these and we're going to try and make a lovely uh, little snail that's going to go all the way around the church to show everybody in the community how we are for each other and we're supporting each other um, and it's just a little craft project that everyone can join in, in but to show the community that we're visible we're still here we're not in the building but we're still together and we're still doing things all together it would be great if you could help me do this. I'm waiting for my mum to bring me up some wool so I can start. Um, but good luck and get pom-pom making and get rock painting and we'll have a beautifully decorated church very, very soon. Take care. Keep safe. Bye. Hi. The Such love of the gospel is definitely worth sharing. And we can share that love in a whole host of, of different ways. So Heather's been talking about something that might just be a wee bit of a sign outside the building that might help uh, draw some folks' attention and to, folk, to who we are and what we're about and also giving opportunity. We're going to have opportunity there for folks to be putting up some, some prayers and doing a wee caterpillar of hope and, and love. But I also wanted to um, speak today about another organization that can be right, a good resource for us in, in sharing our faith. And it's a group called Solas. They're about persuasively communicating Christ in today's culture. And that's what they do, and they provide resources, training, and inspiration for sharing your faith with compassion and conviction. And there's a number of ways that they can help. They can help. And one of them they, is a series of videos they've done with, with short answers to particular problems. Does, do miracles still happen today? Why does God allow suffering? And, and so on. And we're going to be looking at one of them, them in just a, a moment or two about where is God in a coronavirus world. They've also got on their website some other articles um, and some talks or interviews with folks who are sharing the Christian faith uh, um, and sharing the good news and giving resources and ideas and support for us. So I recommend their, their website. The details will be on, on the screen. And as I say, just to give us a, a flavor of what they provide and how they do it, we're going to hear from their director, Andy Bannister, speaking about where is God in a coronavirus world. Where is God in a coronavirus world? You know, as I film this video uh, here in the UK, we're under lockdown as many countries in the world are and uh, struggling to cope uh, with a pandemic uh, that's causing chaos and destruction. And many people are asking all kinds of questions. And a question that often arises is, is where is God uh, in the midst of all this? 
And you know, the way I want to begin to think about that question is it struck me as, uh, as the virus has unfolded and as uh, we've experienced uh, you know, living uh, under lockdown conditions, one of the things I find fascinating is that coronavirus raises all kinds of religious and, and spiritual questions. Um, it's uh, exposed a number of things. One of the first things I think that a coronavirus has exposed is that science can't answer everything. You know, we've addressed that question in other short answer videos, but you know, we live in an age that's encouraged us to think that science can answer everything. Uh, you know, in terms of dealing with the virus, you hear people saying, we just need to follow the science. But in recent uh, days and weeks, it's emerged, of course, that actually, which science are we talking about? There are scientists with uh, equally long uh, lists of credentials to their names who disagree profoundly uh, about the best way to deal with this virus. And I think governments are discovering that actually the response uh, that is required uh, by leadership, uh, yes, it needs to be informed by the science, but actually politics is what's needed. And politics and science are not the same thing. And I think coronavirus has exposed that actually science is really helpful in certain areas, but it can't actually help us make big decisions uh, about, uh, about how we structure societies given what we're facing. So that's the first thing. I think the coronavirus has also revealed uh, that many of us um, have put our trust in things that are profoundly fallible. You know, for many of us, particularly in the Western world, we had our very nice lives set up. You know, we had our job and we had our standard of living and we had the sports that we were into. We had our community of friends. For Christians, we had our churches. Everything was structured and nice and ordered and life was wonderful. And along came this, uh, this pandemic and has swept all of those things away. And I think for many people, it's exposed that actually maybe the things we were placing our hope and our certainty and our confidence in uh, are not actually what they were cracked up to be. Um, I was reading a, an essay uh, by an atheist journalist called Douglas Murray uh, in a magazine the other day talking about this and saying that actually the one question that our society has avoided for so long <clears throat> has been the question of purpose. And the coronavirus has forced us to ask the question of what is human life really, really about? And for some people, that's a very uncomfortable question. The third thing I think coronavirus has uh, revealed that I find fascinating is it's revealed also how instinctively Christian uh, many of our societies are. I mean, if you think about coronavirus and what it's doing purely in atheistic and naturalistic terms, you could, you could argue that here we have, uh, you know, Darwinianism revealed in all of its glory, because along has come this virus, and what's it doing? It's primarily predating on the weak, the poor, the, poor, the elderly, uh, those who simply don't measure up uh, biologically. It's thinning out the weak. We see survival of the fittest in all of its glory. But isn't it interesting that we're not responding that way? No government minister, no, no, no matter how atheistic they are, has come out and gone, let's just let the virus kill as many old people as possible because society will get stronger. We all instinctively know that's not the right approach. And so most societies have crashed their economies in order to protect the weak and the vulnerable and the elderly. Fascinating. That's a profoundly Christian response, not a profoundly atheistic response. And then lastly, I think the other thing that I think the coronavirus has exposed is that many of us are simply not used to thinking about our, our mortality. We've kidded ourselves into the fact that, you know, we're going to live forever and nothing can touch us. Look at ours, aren't we clever with all the science and technology we have? And suddenly along comes a pandemic and it reveals that we are mortal and we need to think about some of those big questions that we've possibly been avoiding. And you know what's interesting, as people have thought about those questions, those questions, when you pursue them, they don't take you away from God, or they actually take you towards God. Uh, a secular magazine here in the UK, The New Statesman, uh, ran an article just a few days before I'm recording this video called How Coronavirus is Leading to a Religious Revival. And it picked up on the fact that more people are listening to religious content. Uh, churches that are streaming services are finding numbers going through the roof. Uh, some of the apps you can get on your phone to read things like the Bible have seen a huge spike in downloads as I think people are beginning to ask tough, tough questions. And so, yeah, for Christians, there is a question of where is God in the midst of all this? But the Bible has always been very honest uh, that we live in a world that is broken, a world where there is suffering, but that actually God is there to be found in the middle of that. And that actually the way we get through times like the COVID virus is not by running away from God, but by pressing deeper in.
By the way, if you want to think more about where is God in a coronavirus world, a book I can hugely recommend is a book with that very title, uh, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? It's written by uh, John Lennox uh, from Oxford. John is a good friend and a brilliant writer. And uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful little book. Uh, just costs a couple of pounds. And uh, there'll be a link in the uh, notes to this video as to where you can check it out and get a copy either in prints like this one or an e-version of it if you'd like. Wonderful read if you want to think more about that question.